Okay, so we're going to try to, in very short effort, sort of go through um, some of the other things. Um, aesthetics. Now, that's my report, and uh, I'll try and do this very briefly. The aesthetics is sort of how the plant looks to the, the community and all around. And one of the things that's really not covered in aesthetics, and we only found it in the other, um, other <coughs> CEQA considerations is, one of the mitigations that they're proposing for the greenhouse gas and energy usage is to put in solar panels. And the, the mitigation might be worse than what it's, it might cause even worse problems. And that these uh, gold areas here are where they're proposing to put in highly reflective uh, solar panel arrays all around the plant which would then just increase the whole visual footprint from the mountaintop and everything uh, you know, immensely, as well as views from along Ski Village Drive, which is along the, uh, the top of this slide here, Ski Village Drive. And view. And so, and, view, yeah. <laughs> and you know, now the aesthetics, you see this is only, we only found this in the 5.0 document. The, um, Aesthetics section itself basically says there is no new aesthetic issues to be found in this in this plant. Now, one of the important things to consider in an environmental impact report is the baseline. You know, like what is a change? You, they they are saying the plant itself was there before it started, and the baseline is when they bought the property. They say we didn't have to really make the baseline until 2000. It, till we released the NOP, but we're nice guys, so we're going to go back until when we bought the building as the baseline, which is a good admission on their part. But then they say that they will also abide by the 1998 mitigation agreement signed between Dannon and the county. And this was a sort of, not a CEQA thing, but this was a developmental uh, agreement between county and Dannon, which had a number of mitigations in it that <clears throat> were applicable to all subsequent owners of the property. And part of that was the building would not be consist of highly reflective materials. And that the, the color scheme would be determined in consultation with the county and the city. Now they never did that. They painted the building bright white. And they never and they also said there would be landscaping or a berm to shield the parking areas and the trucking area tra areas from view from the uh, along Ski Village Drive. That was, they put in a few scraggly plants and a see-through fence, and that's all that's there, and they put in a few new plants by, planted by the Boy Scouts since then, but you can still, much of the plant is still visible along Ski Village Drive, and there was never any consultation with the city. So we're arguing that the baseline needs to be the enforcement of the original 1998 agreement, and that building should not be built of a highly reflective white paint, and that would be an effective mitigation to, be to sort of have something a little more uh, hidden away. They also say that the, uh, the project site can be seen within long-range scenic vistas of the valley, valley, although it is not the dominant visual feature. Um, you know, I went up Everett Memorial, and you have a view here of what it looks like from Everett Memorial along the way up to Mount Shasta. And then along Spring, this is a view from the Spring Hill Trail. Um, so there are a number of different mitigations that we think need to be addressed in the aesthetic uh, thing here, as well as the lighting and, uh, the lighting and glare of this. They've got in numerous lights and things that they'll be putting up there. They're, they're saying they're putting in LED lights, but we need to have much more <laughs> detailed analysis of their lighting plan so there's not so much uh, light and glare from the different uh, external uh, illumination that the trucking areas and the building illumination will have. So those are all necessary to be addressed. So that's sort of the aesthetic issue. Uh, Biology is um, Geneva again. You have a quick comment on biology. Yes, I need my notes. And then cultural, which I'll just add. So, biological 
resources uh, section seems to talk mainly about the construction impacts. Um, they'll have to do some, replace some piping down along the uh, South Old Stage Road uh, in order to upgrade some sewer pipes for the sewer system. Um, and they talk about, you know, some construction impacts there. They talk about construction impact around, around the plant. Uh, but they don't talk, um, they don't talk uh, much at all about, about some of the things going, going on in, in those con construction areas as well as uh, what could be ongoing biological resource impacts. So let me start with, um, uh, with these biological resource things, um, they're usually required to, uh, you know, first of all, they go to various databases and pull up lists of what are potential sensitive species that may be in the area of the project site. And then they also have to do their own surveys. They did a survey one day, um, April 24th in 2016. Um, I question whether that's enough to really determine what resources, what biological resources are there. Um, they have a list of 58 potential plant species that might be in the area. And for 21 of them, they say they being whoever made this report, right? 21 of them, 21 of them, there is suitable habitat in the area, but they didn't see any of them when they were there on, on August 24th. And they then exclude all of those from any further consideration. Now, one of the things about observation is there's usually a, a window that is considered to be um, suitable observation time when <coughs> plants are in bloom, so they're, they're, you know they're going to be present, uh, both the green leafy parts and, and the flowers. For many of these, um, the range is some month to August, but if you're looking at August 24th, you're at the way end of that period, and I question whether or not that is suitable to really identify whether the species are there. So I think there's been inadequate observation events um, to really validate what species need to be there. <coughs> the draft EIR shows that there are, uh, the FDA has to approve the, um, their bottling process. That's a federal agency. And that means there are federal regulations that apply. Uh, Relative to biological resources, it means the U.S. Fish and Wild Service has to sign off on this project. And I could not find any documentation in the draft EIR to show that that has happened. So I think there are issues about whether or not that federal component, um, of those federal verifications are there. Um, there is work on this um, section of sewer along South, uh, South Old Stage uh, includes a section where there's a stream that goes underneath those pipes. Uh huh? Yeah, they propose to uh, help the city by putting a, a, a bigger sewer line uh, piece in where there seems to be a bottleneck. Oh, uh -huh. oh in the meadow there. Out in the meadow. South of, south of uh, the Fish Hatchery Road there in that, that meadow. Okay. Next to the freeway. Okay. Where the Cold Creek, where we just had a, a spill. Right. Yeah. There was a busted line. Yeah. Okay. So, so they say they might have to disturb. There's a culvert for that creek that goes under the roadway there. They say they might, in the process of putting in these sewer pipes, they might have to disturb that stream bed. That is something that needs to be evaluated. Um, and all they say in here that as their mitigation they are going to get the appropriate permits from the appropriate agencies to do that. And I think it's inadequate for the purposes of this draft EIR. They should have to have those permits um, in order for this draft EIR to be um, So I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. Irrigation? 
um, but they're all they're, the whole idea about irrigating uh, uh, um, you know, some of their property with waste treated wastewater. Uh, the biological resource implications of that are, are not addressed, and it provides conflicting information. In one place, they say they're going to irrigate grass fields. Well, so there's not grass fields there, so they have to be converted to grass fields. In another place, they say it's going to be a Christmas tree farm. Mm -hmm. um, or orchards. <laughs> I read orchards somewhere. And, or orchards. Mm -hmm. And in another place, it says, oh, the, the construction impacts on those areas are going to be temporary for putting in the pipeline, but that's only temporary because they're going to then let it just revert to its natural vegetation. So they're given three different scenarios, um, and none of those have been evaluated for their biological resource um, I impacts. Um, if you put 100,000 gallons of water a day for six months, five days a week, that's like adding about 50 inches of rainfall per year on an area that gets about 37 inches on average. I think there could be huge biological impacts. That, okay. that aren't addressed. Diane on soil and geology. I'll, I'll just stand here because my report is, is quite brief. Good. Um, we're awaiting our <laughs> hydrogeology reports as well, but I did review the section. And um, the report states that the typical profile of the, so or the soil is 95%, um, 94% of the soil is deep, 125 gravelly, gravelly, loamy, permeable sand, which apparently is what they're saying exists on the property. The soil is characterized as having a slight hazard of erosion. This is what they say, a low shrink swell potential and being highly corrosive to concrete and is assigned to having a high filtration rate when thoroughly wet. There is concern that this soil is not suitable in areas of leach fields and allows perhaps a high groundwater infiltration. Some of the soil also has already been removed through construction and the, the uh, deep soil only goes down a certain level. The report in the soil section is interesting because it also talks about the four wastewater treatment um, options and in the if you didn't read further to where Geneva was describing as a reader of the report you might stop there because the wastewater treatment options <coughs> option one of putting all of the uh, sewage into the uh, CD system says that there is no impact mm -hmm. and the second third and fourth um, the fourth being increasing the leach field to 108,000 gallons per day is a less than significant um, mitigation. It also has some areas of erosion control that are certainly questionable. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Not bad. Okay. Um, then there's the noise section. And I think along with aesthetics, I think also the noise is something where I think a lot of people can make interesting comments based on your own personal experience, where it doesn't take a lot of technical knowledge. Now, if you look at the noise section of this report, it becomes rather technical rather quickly. But I think it's important to sort of, you know, analyze a couple of things to know a couple of things. They in the noise basically come to the conclusion that there will be no appreciable noise impact from the operation of this plant, except through the uh, operation of the diesel, of the propane generators, which they then will mitigate by putting uh, sound uh, absorbing walls around the, the generators. However, they uh, sort of just pull a lot of numbers out of the air as far as, and we're, that's one of the things our consultant is looking into is look where they get some of these numbers as to like how much decibels a you know, chiller unit causes or how much the, the uh, air conditioning unit causes and then the attenuation over distance, that kind of thing he'll be analyzing. But I think there's a lot of just first-hand experience where people know the operations of this plant in the past 
which would be which was a much smaller footprint as far as the equipment on the routes. Uh, their personal experience shows that there was appreciable noise being generated by the old plant. And just common sense will indicate that some of these so-called numbers need to be challenged. So I think there is where personal experience can be very valuable in making comments about this. They also uh, do an analysis of, well, there's going to be some property, some noise being generated from the north side of the plant and some from the south side of the plant. And they then do attenuation structures. But they do not analyze that most of the noise equipment is on the roof mm -hmm. and will be, you know, as high up over there above the berms, above the vegetation and sound blocking materials and will be radiating uh, much more. They do not even address that in this uh, EIR. So um, those kind of uh, issues need to be addressed very carefully, as well as the uh, traffic. They say, you know, that the truck traffic will mostly be on the west end of the building, sort of uh, facing where the, the west end of the buildings where the loading docks is. And they're saying, well, if the trucks will turn off their engines after five minutes yeah, right. of idling. Uh -huh. But uh, then there's an analysis of how much truck traffic and truck noise, which seems to be rather ad hoc. And our, both our transportation and our noise people will be uh, doing that. Another thing that is stated in the noise section is that no reported noise complaints were received by the county during previous construction activities occurring between 2015 and 16. And that, I don't know how they, their, their own document contradicts that because there's five different NOP comments that I could find where people testified in their own comments to this document about the amount of noise that was done both during the construction period and during Dan's operations. So, we will be submitting those as sort of contradictory. But that is something, if you have personal experience, you know other people who have experienced that, that would be very key in having that uh, documented. And you know, the traffic noise is going to be uh, rather significant, we, we uh, tend to uh, find. And they also have a thing that, where they're saying there's basically going to be no truck traffic uh, effects except to two different houses along that route there. So I think we need to be able to challenge that. So um, quickly, that was the noise summary. Uh, Frank, do you want to take on your two topics on oh, I, I greenhouse gas, climate, and hazardous material, and maybe just quickly sort of concatenate them? Excuse me? Uh, slides. Them? Oh, we lost the... Oh, there we go. Can you okay. go behind, Frank, can you go behind okay. the podium so they can sign you? And you, can you kind of get it all done in five minutes? So, which, just let me know what slide you'd like to bring up. Uh, well, I don't really need, uh, I don't really need uh, a slide right now. Okay. I, I need the one for uh, radius. Flat uh, radius. The explosion. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank is doing a ha a hazardous materials. Well, I, I well, amongst actually, other things. I actually have a few, uh, or at least a few comments. Can't hear you. Talk so loud. What is okay. this one? Uh, I'll explain it a bit. <laughs> Our topic is hazardous materials. Yeah, the topic is hazardous materials. I don't know what his topic is. Hold on. No. Let him let him get his feet here. Okay. What you talking I, I have a few. I have a few comments on. Uh, I have four different topics I'd like to comment on. The first one is air quality. Uh, one of the things is they, uh, they've uh, ascertained that anybody who resides in the caretaker's residence actually has uh, an appreciable risk of uh, cancer or being there. So they're only going to uh, um, uh, allow people to be there for 40 hours a week. Of course, there's 168 hours in a week, so that'll be interesting math. Uh, and then we're not sure if that, uh, if, if their assessment like really fully addresses all of all of the trucking that they're going to have there. Uh, we're trying to get information about that, but they're reticent to provide it. Another thing is that uh, uh, they, in this same section, they're saying that well, the nearest school is like 2,000 feet away on Chestnut 
Street, the Chestnut Preschool, and they never mentioned that, you know, right next door there's the Jehovah's Witness uh, Hall, and they have a Sunday school there. You know, and it's right next door, but that's never mentioned. And so there's a, there's a lot of, um, you know, as you look through here, there, there's a lot of things that are just neglected or, you know, definitely omitted. And uh, if you know, if you read these things and you know these, you should comment on it. Uh, we were also trying to find out about uh, if, uh, you know, the polyethylene terephthalate uh, gave off odors during their processing when they, when they blow the, uh, the little preforms into bottles. Uh, and in our research, one of the things we found was that, well, that causes antimony or antimony to be um, there on the surface of the bottles. But now they're telling us that they're not going to rinse the bottles out anymore. That they have an aseptic process where they just kind of blow air and <coughs> stuff like that. But uh, I'm not sure how effective that would be to remove the antimony. What's the antimony? The heavy uh, metal. It's the heavy metal. Uh, oh, okay. it, it causes health problems. You know, it, definitely there's uh, some uh, documented, uh, you know, uh, health uh, effects of it, and there's su suspicions all the way into different kinds of cancers. And, uh, one of them that has fairly good uh, documentation is chronic uh, pulmonary pulmonary obstructive disease. Um, I know someone who recently just died of that. <laughs> but um, so anyway, uh, although that doesn't really address air quality, I, I wanted to make people aware of that uh, in case you want to have your own personal boycott of uh, Crystal Geyser products mm -hmm. because you don't want to be consuming the antimony. Uh, and now on uh, greenhouse <coughs> gases, uh, we find our, our research uh, shows that um, you know really. Uh, Crystal Geyser goes on about, well, they're, they're just going to take these preforms, you know, they have little test tube-like uh, uh, plugs that they grab on. Oh, you oh. Got Thank you, Brian. Wow. Well, you, you, these are, are these preforms? They don't look, they have other... They're, yeah, they're different size bottles. The big one's a gallon. This one's a gallon. Pull it out. Pull it out. Let's have a look. Okay. Well, they have something like this. Uh, GED actually showed a much larger one at the uh, Board of Supervisors a while back. <coughs> Depending on the size. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bigger one. And, and then, the, you know, they, they grab it by the neck and then they heat it up and they blow it out and blow it into a mold and that makes the bottle. And, and the antimony is on the surfaces of it. Uh, but uh, the manufacturing uh, of <laughs> Terephthalate is actually, you know, they, they get the um, pellets of it. And